Um, my name is Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the executive director here at the Harvard Law School Library. Today's speakers are experts in what they do, and I'm really excited to um, hear them share the work they did editing equity and law fusion and fission. Um, so let me introduce our two, two panelists. Before I start, I want to say we are recording, um, so you are on notice. Uh, John Goldberg is an expert in tort law, tort theory, and political philosophy. He joined the law school faculty in 2008 and previously taught at Vanderbilt. He's a co-author of a leading textbook, Tort Law, Responsibilities, and Redress, as well as the Oxford Introductions to U.S. Law Torts. He's published dozens of articles and essays in scholarly journals. He's taught in a broad array of first-year and upper-level courses and has received multiple teaching prizes. An associate reporter for the American Law Institute's fourth restatement of property, he's also served as an advisor to the third restatement of torts. In addition, he's a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Tort Law and Legal Theory, and in 2009 was chair of the Torts and Compensation Systems section of the Association of American Law Schools. He clerked for Judge Jack Weinstein of the Eastern District of New York and for Supreme Court Justice Byron White. Before he um, taught at Vanderbilt, he briefly practiced law here in Boston. Henry Smith is the Fessendorf Professor of Law here at Harvard, where he directs the project on the foundations of private law. Previously, he taught at the Northwestern University School of Law and was the Fred A. Johnston Professor of Property and Environmental Law at Yale. After law school, he clerked for the Honorable Ralph K. Ralph K. Winter, the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. He's written primarily on law and economics of property and intellectual property, with a focus on how property-related institutions lower information costs and constrain strategic behavior. He teaches primarily in the areas of property, IP, natural resources, remedies, and law and economics. In 2015 to 16, he served as the president of the Society for Institutional and Organizational Economics. And in 2014, the American Law Institute named him reporter for a fourth restatement of property. Copies of today's book will be available um, outside of the room if you're interested in purchasing one. But without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Henry Smith and John Goldberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction and uh, the invitation to speak uh, about this book. Um, and so what we thought we'd do is uh, instead of uh, like having some deep poet reading or something from the book, uh, we, would, uh, we, would have, um, we would split it a little bit and uh, maybe set this in a sort of larger motivational context uh, before getting to the book itself. Uh, and I'll... Uh, I'll sort of start things going, uh, get, and I'll talk about the first half of the book, and, uh, uh, and John will uh, uh, take it from there. Uh, so th we're, we only have two out of the three editors of this book uh, here. The other editor is uh, Peter Turner uh, from Cambridge, who uh, is an Australian, and I will point out why that's significant uh, uh, in a little bit. Um, just hold that thought. Uh, and uh, so the title is Equity and Law, Fusion and Fission. OK, so uh, these are all accepted terms like equity, although that's the big mystery. Law, I guess that's a mystery too. Uh, but then fusion and fission, we also have the, this, uh, this phenomenon of fusion that I'll get to in a second. Uh, we don't usually use the word fission. Uh, that was kind of a uh, sort of a pun. Uh, but uh, th what, what that means is, um, uh, legal systems that uh, actually distinguish equity, even though it's, uh, that runs against the uh, historic tide of, uh, of fusion, as well as we'll see. So, the first, uh, let me give you a little overview. Um, uh, I'll talk about what what equity is. Uh, that might be a funny place to start, but not really because we don't have courses in equity. We don't uh, usually even think of it as a separate subject matter. We don't often we often deal with it, but don't mention it by name. Uh, very different from other. Uh, common law legal systems, uh, where equity is uh, more front and center, uh, much more of a topic, as you, if you will. Uh, then I'll talk about what is fusion. Uh, and fusion here means, in the first instance, putting f historic law and equity courts together. But it often winds up meaning a lot more than that. Uh, and you could even argue that fusion is sort of the, uh, the, the sort of founding event in some ways of, uh, of uh, modern law. That's probably an exaggeration, but uh, 
not, not too much. Uh, and then uh, more uh, tied to the book, I'll talk a little bit about uh, comparative and historical aspects of fusion and fission uh, as a lens uh, on equity. So one way of understanding equity is to ask what fusion was supposed to mean, how, what it meant, how it worked out, as a way of getting a handle on these different meanings of equity. So in a sense, uh, fusion, as, especially as, uh, as explored in this book, is a way of getting a handle on what, uh, what we even mean by equity, and for that matter, what we should mean about equity going forward, uh, because the issue of fusion is in some sense still with us. Okay, so what is equity? Uh, so I put the in quotation marks because the word equity uh, comes up in a lot of different contexts, and there, uh, many of them are actually related to the topic at hand. Uh, so the sort of most concrete uh, meaning of it is that uh, uh, equity refers to a bunch of courts that uh, emerged in the late 14th century or around about there uh, in the activities of the chancellor. So it's associated with the chancellor. The chancellor was a, an official who had many different roles, uh, one of which was to dispense justice according to the king's conscience and so forth, and that later on became uh, 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 more uh, a body of law. Uh, we still do have separate courts of equity in a few states, the most very few states, uh, two or three at this point. Um, Delaware, it depends on how you count, and Delaware is the most famous one because corporate law is a creature, it's an outgrowth of trust and an outgrowth of equity, and uh, so the Delaware Chancery Court is uh, an, a court of equity, and it often thinks of itself that way. Now, of course, it means uh, maybe something uh, different than it means in other countries and at other times, but the whole question of Delaware corporate law is actually, uh, in some sense, within the, uh, the scope here. Many areas of law grew out of equity, uh, so trust is uh, the obvious one, uh, mortgages, guardianship, all the ones listed here, including business organizations, uh, grew out of equity. And so these are entire areas of, of law, not just that were influenced by equity, but that grew out of equity courts. Maybe you're familiar with equitable maxims. I will go through a couple of them later, uh, like, um, uh, uh, the equi uh, equity, you, to come into equity, you must have uh, clean hands and so forth, or uh, to come into equity, the, the uh, remedy at law must be inadequate, things like that. And I think these days we don't really talk much about those. Uh, I think they're regarded as kind of uh, curiosities and they don't really guide decision making and so forth, and I'll return to what that actually means. Uh, but there are a whole bunch of defenses and remedies and so forth that are clearly labeled equitable, uh, that, uh, and that does make some difference because uh, they are uh, treated somewhat specially, and uh, as we'll see in a moment, jury trial applies, uh, uh, does not apply in equity, and so we uh, have reason to keep these separate in the American context, uh, even beyond uh, whatever the merits are of keeping them separate. Uh, and uh, some of these uh, remedies cover a large, large uh, uh, waterfront. So you have traditional injunctions, you have injunctions in the private law context, you have structural injunctions, uh, nationwide injunctions are now uh, kind of in the news. Uh, injunctions are, uh, that alone uh, w would be a big topic um, uh, right off the bat. Uh, it's also a method of interpretation. So here we have statutory interpretation uh, in the first year, and uh, very typically, as I'll mention in a moment, we have uh, a case that raises the question of equitable interpretation, and that's always been a tradition, and it uh, has uh, sort of narrower and broader versions, and uh, so equity comes up in that context. Uh, and more generally, uh, we use the word equitable to mean fairness and justice, and the equity courts were not, didn't have a monopoly on fairness and justice, but they certainly couched their analysis more directly in terms of certain notions of fairness and justice uh, than, uh, than uh, was the case in other courts. Here's a little picture. Uh, actually, if you go to the Wikipedia entry for equity, I think this is the picture you get. Uh, this is a very famous picture. Uh, and I, oh, it's actually good I have a clicker because I can actually point. Uh, so, <laughs> The chancellor is, or vice chancellor is looking mighty bored here. Uh, one problem is the English, uh, I know there's some actual experts on English uh, equity here, so I'm going to try to be careful, but the English equity courts were rather overloaded, and if you uh, look at, you know, Bleak House is the sort of uh, standard uh, put down of equity, uh, the, they were very overloaded, uh, very expensive, and so you have hordes of lawyers, yes, those are the lawyers, and then you have like this poor guy who's bringing his last sack of money to pay the hordes of locust lawyers and so forth. And so this was, a, this I think was meant as a critique of uh, equity. Uh, I'll skip two, two slides uh, just to sort of uh, emphasize the same point. Um, 
th this is a little picture that I found in our Harvard Law Library, and it's a, a temptation for lawyers because a suit in chancery is being presented by the little imps to tempt the lawyers to you know, rip people off and get them in a quagmire of you know, uh, horrible stuff. But there was a different uh, view of equity, um, and this is a little bit of a caricature, but uh, uh, um, Joseph Story, who uh, was uh, um, here as well as uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice, actually wrote an entire treatise on equity and he was uh, quite uh, into it. And you know, given his overall outlook, it was not surprising that he was more sympathetic to equity. And uh, this uh, quotation here is in one of his writings where he uh, says, okay, English equity courts do a variety of things and what should we take of this for the American context? And then he basically starts going through the problems. So it was, in some sense, it was a kind of functional account of what equity was uh, needed for. And he says, uh, you know, accident, mistake, uh, complicated accounts between parties and so forth. And it kind of goes on and on and on, uh, very, and sometimes a little bit poetic, you know, like uh, with the, uh, okay, the, the moats flying through the air and so forth. And, but the idea is that uh, there are problems that equity courts, or at least equity itself, he, he was mildly in favor of uh, separate equity courts. Uh, uh, would solve um, more uh, directly using the tools of equity. Uh, and the, um, that whole view uh, is in competition with the skepticism. So I just had felt I had to put the chancellor's foot. That's what this is about. So you know the common lawyers, the ones who are most hostile, and they came really in variety. There's, there, there's kind of a caricature of like common lawyers didn't like equity and vice versa. Most of the time they cooperated. But there was this um, worry about discretion in equity, and it's always been a worry, and uh, equity lawyers worry about it too, but the, the sort of snap he put down is, well, uh, equity is like the chancellor's foot. You know, we have a foot for measurement. Well, it's the chancellor's foot, and of course, chancellors have different sized feet, meaning that they have different views of justice and fairness, and so their discretion is gonna work out differently. Uh, and that's a challenge. Um, uh, so Selden is kind of uh, associated with that. So what is, um, so the question for us is, is this distinction still useful? Is this, um, uh, and I, I say possibly, uh, and I think the book in general is fairly optimistic on that, partly because it's uh, a book that uh, incorporates viewpoints from across the common law world. Uh, and uh, so I think that uh, is likely, I think there the answer would be more like probably. Um, and. Uh, I don't think we should necessarily be entirely tied to what the historic package of equity is. I mean, some of the chapters here, and uh, John will talk about this more, raise questions about how, yes, we have this historic history of equity jurisdiction, but there are certain fundamental problems in law uh, that uh, we have to face. The sort of limits of uh, formality being one of them. How do we deal with that? Uh, one way is through traditional equity, but it, it sort of raises these questions in a more a uh, fundamental way. More concretely, certain remedies grew out of uh, the courts of equity, and um, so uh, we have to pay attention for that reason. And it's also, as I said, uh, very hard to overcome the law and equity distinction completely in the United States because the Seventh Amendment requires uh, jury trials, and no state, well, very few states have really experimented much with giving juries uh, control over equitable issues. Uh, and that may be because of skepticism about juries, but it also may be that some of these issues are very difficult for juries to, to deal with. So for instance, if you're going to have continuing supervision over an injunction, it's very hard to see how a jury can do that. Uh, you know, taking that much time off work is really not uh, gonna happen. Um, and the, another aspect of this that comes out in some of these chapters is that there's a whole philosophical tradition of equity. And unlike some philosophy, no insult to philosophers, but uh, this is a philosophy that uh, is not latent. It's not that we're discovering the latent philosophy in the law. It's out there in the open. Uh, courts cite this uh, Aristotelian uh, account of equity all over the place. Uh, and the idea, this is just the snappy phrase, but there's a whole discussion of this in Aristotle, that law, equity corrects the law where law is defective because of its generality. And then the question is, well, why would anything be defective because of its generality? And where does law break down because it's trying to be general? Uh, where does it leave problems where there's a lack of fit and so forth. In first year, you may have uh, discussed the Riggs versus Palmer problem, the murdering heir, and, and I don't want to get sort of deeply into this. Um, 
Uh, I have a view on this case that, well, first of all, the, the, this is held up as an example of equitable reasoning. It happened, as I'll mention uh, in a moment, it happened uh, shortly after fus the fusion of or merger of law and equity courts in New York. And if you read line by line in this case, the court is very conscious of the fact that we don't have separate equity courts. And so it relabels all the equitable stuff, the equity of the statute, the equitable interpretation of the will, and so forth, as common law maxims and so forth. But it's basically implementing the idea that you can't profit from your own wrong, and it has this equitable flavor, and it brings up all these equitable issues. Interestingly, Riggs versus Palmer is used as the chestnut for jurisprudence. So every big theory of the law with a capital L uh, comes down to Riggs versus Palmer, starting with Dworkin and uh, onwards, uh, back, backwards and forwards. Actually, it goes back to the legal process and all the way forward still now. Big issues, okay, but it also has this equitable aspect, and uh, the question is, and I would argue maybe in the Q&A, that there are more narrowly, and I don't mean that insultingly, uh, equitable ways of dealing with this question. Here's a little sampler, if I have time, uh, for uh, equitable maxims and applications. Uh, and the first one is, don't, don't let a wrongdoer profit uh, from their own wrong. Equity acts in, in personam, like the person before you, it's not, uh, we're not reconstructing property rights and so forth. Uh, although in rem means a lot, you know, if it, in rem means a school district, that's that's a that's a, a quite wide ranging. Uh, you have to come in with clean hands. So if you're uh, if you're uh, engaged in skullduggery, you're not going to get your injunction or specific performance. And equity follows the law. Okay, is that does that really happen and so forth? And I give a little c case here where it's kind of uh, interesting case where. The, the, eminent domain happened and the project fell through and the previous owners wanted their property back and the, the, the town of Charleston or whatever it was said, no, we're just selling it to other people and that looks like, that looks like kind of scummy behavior. But the statute said, this is a final sale, no, no messing with it. And so equity had no purchase there. And now let's just do a little bit of a, I just can't resist, it's building encroachments are a nice example <laughs> here because we're gonna have a nice slide in a moment. Uh, so in property, you may have done building encroachments. If you had me for property, you definitely did building encroachments. And this is a problem. People still do building encroachments. Uh, it's a continuing trespass uh, under the sort of rules of thumb that would normally lead to an injunction, even though injunctions are not uh, as of right. It's close to, uh, to being that with a continuing trespass. However, if somebody does a minor encroachment in good faith and uh, they would be greatly burdened by the injunction, uh, much more so than the other party would be benefited, you can, there is an out. You can use damages, no injunction, and uh, the disproportionate hardship defense. Uh, this is relevant, by the way, into patent trolls. We can talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, patent trolls are very much, this hold up dynamic is there. But as in patent trolls, there's potential uh, opportunism on both sides. Now, this, this next case that I'll just mention, mm -hmm. Powell versus Pedrick, is kind of a, quasi chestnut in first year property. And the way it's presented is, here's a, an example of a building encroach, a very minor one. So this building here is the, uh, the one that did the encroaching, uh, that was the encroaching building. The parking lot is, there was a building there uh, 100 years ago plus. And uh, the idea was, in the bad old days when common law was common law, they tore down buildings when people went over the line by less than an inch because, hey, rules. Because rules, okay? That's the way this case is presented. This is not, I think, the best interpretation of this case. I've taught this case many times, and uh, you know, you look at it more and more. Uh, uh, Brian Lee, whom both of us uh, work with uh, a lot of times, went and found all the things that were going on in this case. Evidently, these parties were engaged in incredible uh, strategic behavior over whether there'd be open windows, would this be a party wall if there were open windows, what's gonna happen next, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea was that there might have been disproportionate hardship, but not here. Uh, they, nobody qualified for that. Uh, and so that looks like a harsh result, but actually it's probably not. So what, what's the domain of equity? There are a lot of different ways of uh, describing it. One is that the, the, the sort of traditional way was to say fraud, accident, and mistake would be the kind of you know, that's where equity would start, we'd start talking about it. Uh, and unconscionability would be kind of a, a classic example. You know, there are specific triggers. So like in various areas of law, you know, building encroachments being one of them, uh, you look for some combination of deception or bad faith and uh, skewed results, uh, hardship. 
uh, and, it, and the result is that you start taking a hard look against the person who might benefit from this. Uh, and it, as I say, it's, it depends on the area of law what, what the nature, the sort of combination of these factors would be in terms of the trigger for equity. That brings us to fusion, okay, uh, and, uh, and the book. And so I say here, is equity uh, a fact, a fallacy, or a fantasy? Those, these F words are like pr proliferate in this area. Uh, and um, the fusion fallacy is a um, term that Australians uh, came up with um, to describe the, the following argument that, well, we merged law and equity courts, and therefore we have to merge, fuse, assimilate the two bodies of law. Uh, and they say, no, that doesn't follow. Uh, you can have unitary courts and separate law, and so don't, uh, don't make that argument. Um, Fission is a little bit trickier. It's uh, that there are places, uh, New South Wales being a very primary one, where uh, over the over history there has been an effort to keep equity separate. Uh, whether it you know it kind of waxes and wanes, uh, and so there are chapters that have to do with uh, fission. Um, one very common argument that's also sort of uh, uh, supports hyperfusionism is that, well, the law equity divide was just a historical happenstance, and so it's just sort of like a historical curiosity, and that's it. I don't think the chapters in this book really uh, support that very well. Uh, on the contrary, I think it's more uh, in the other direction, as I'll uh, say in a moment. Um, but functionalists, and I guess I count uh, myself as some variety, you know, people who are uh, sort of interested in explaining uh, law, you know, in terms of how it works, maybe even according to external criteria, tend to see equity as not uh, being anything special and tend to be pro-fusion. Uh, again, I think you know, without using the word fallacy, I would say that that uh, doesn't necessarily have to go together. Uh, and the it's curious thing is that anti-fusionists, the ones who are most uh, keen on keeping it separate, tend to uh, argue from within. So they convince, the, there's a sort of preaching to the choir is going on here where, you know, it's like, well, it's a special mentality. You have to be, uh, you know, in the know. You're not going to convince people who are not already in the know uh, with those kinds of uh, arguments, I think. Um, I won't go through this, but I will say that I, my, my own, one of my own views about this is that uh, the fusion culminated, the culmination of fusion was during the legal realist era. And so a lot of the sort of way that equity was diffused into law took a very kind of realist form in the, or form or maybe a formless form in the United States. And so a lot of multi-factor balancing tests can be traced back to uh, a sort of effort to reconstruct of prior equitable analysis, that the equitable analysis before would have had a series of presumptions and factors and you know guidelines and so forth, and the idea was to reduce it to a rule, but it didn't work, and so you would have uh, multiple uh, factor balancing tests. And the result is that uh, if you look at sort of jurisprudence over the 20th century, a lot of the sort of formalism versus contextualism is a an aftershock, in my view, of uh, the law equity distinction being uh, fused in this kind of realist way, but uh, does that sound conclusory? Yes, it is, because it is conclusory, but I'd ha be happy to talk about it. Uh, there are very prominent examples of this, uh, like the Supreme Court's uh, effort in the eBay case from 2006 to restate the law of injunctions, and uh, it was not a good effort, in my opinion, partly because it tried, again, to reduce things to a sort of cut and dried rule that sort of sounded equitable, but really wasn't uh, as structured in the traditional equitable sense. Um, and so uh, I have some writing on that with other people as well. So now to get to the book, we, there are three slides here on, uh, on the table of contents. And um, keying off what I was just saying about fusion and uh, how fusion really profoundly shapes how equity operates in our system and other systems, uh, the first part of this book uh, takes a look, a sort of a look around the common law world at how f uh, fusion did or didn't work, how it was pursued and not pursued in various uh, areas. So Peter, uh, Peter Turner wrote a very general introduction. Uh, this is a very substantive introduction. I commend it to you. It's, uh, it's a sort of how fundamental equity is to the legal system. It's not a summary of the rest of the book. Uh, and then the, the chapters two through eight are basically different areas. And one thing I have to say about uh, the fusion of law and equity is uh, for legal historians, there's still lots of work to do here. There, there's increasing work by people like um, Patricia McMahon and uh, Kellen Funk who w uh, worked on this book. Uh, but 
Uh, this, is, this is, I think, still something that needs to be worked out, particularly how exactly it happened and uh, the later stages of it and so forth. There was lots of writing at the time. People thought that fusion was going to solve everything in the legal system. Uh, of course, it didn't, uh, but that was the hope. Uh, and so the first two chapters by uh, Sam Bray and Colin Funk look at the United States, and Sam looks at it more from a functional point of view, like what, what, what sort of caught on and what didn't catch on in terms of what equity was doing. And uh, you know, there's some things just fell out of favor altogether. Other things like you know, judicial supervision, as particularly in the public law context, uh, kind of took off. And so there was this sort of a, you know, big mismatch in terms of uh, how equity was uh, received. Uh, in latter times, uh, and Kellen Funk goes back to the 19th century and early 20th century and sort of looks at how it worked out on a sort of more micro level. Uh, Michael Lobin is a famous legal historian of England and he looks at the Judicature Acts, which were the sort of um, the statutory vehicle for fusion or merger. They, they use the term fusion more uh, in England. And then uh, uh, we get Canada, which was a very interesting situation where people were coming in with different ideas about equity uh, and so forth. And then uh, we have to have two uh, Australian chapters. New South Wales is in particular like the uh, ground zero of equity, uh, equity pro-equity fervor. And uh, it had, uh, this is 1824 to 1972, and 1972 is when they merged the courts. But as you'll see, if you look at anything like this chapter or the treatises of which uh, Peter is uh, one of the new authors, uh, you'll see that uh, they are very keen on keeping up equity distinct. Uh, and that's a little bit different from uh, colonial Victoria, uh, which um, had a somewhat different uh, tradition, but in many of these chapters, it's interesting, like who goes where, and you know, there's a lot of path dependence, literally, like who actually travel from one place to another. And finally, we uh, look at Scotland, which is not exactly a common law jurisdiction; it's a mixed, a hybrid jurisdiction, common and civil law. And interestingly, there, there were some very famous theorists of equity, but their theory, theories, not clear how they are reflected in law. And it appears that. Scottish law has a very interesting ambivalent attitude towards equity, and uh, if we had you know, another volume two, we would uh, include civil law, which has many equitable notions, but never had separate equity courts. Uh, and so Scotland is sort of a way station towards a whole different world of these kinds of considerations that are not expressed institutionally the way, the way they are in our system, but are still very much with us because equity is uh, associated with some very deep-seated problems in the legal system. And for deep-seated legal problems, uh, we have to turn to John Goldberg. <laughs> Not sure I like being associated with deep-seated legal problems, but uh, okay. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, so this has been a, uh, I will say it's been a pleasure to work on this volume. Um, uh, as uh, the overly generous introduction suggested, I'm mainly a torts person. Most or everything I know about equity, I know thanks to my professor over here. Uh, uh, Professor Smith, um, and I uh, would commend to those of you who are um, uh, interested in scholarship or maybe becoming scholars or thinking of becoming scholars, uh, collaboration um, with the right sort of person uh, uh, is a really tremendous thing. You just, uh, you learn tons, and so I've, uh, I'm grateful to this volume for many reasons, including that I just learned tons uh, that I didn't know about law and equity, um, and one of the things we've tried to do in our little uh, program that Henry runs on the foundations of private law is to expand and um, uh, sort of fertilize, cross-fertilize each other's knowledge of towards contracts, equity, uh, remedies, and sort of build a, uh, build a font of knowledge that way, and this book is uh, uh, part of that effort. Um, so uh, uh, as Henry suggested, there's this sort of idea that most lawyers have, at least they've heard of, the idea that there's law and there's equity, or at least at one time there's law and there's equity, and these are just two different things, and then we're left to puzzle over what these two different things are. And a lot of what the book is about, uh, the various chapters of the book, is kind of trying to refine the inquiry a bit and give a more nuanced um, and complicated picture. Um, <clears throat> and I can give you some examples of, of that. So equity, if, if we just think of equity for the moment as being what happened in uh, the old English courts of equity, in that separate jurisdiction. Well, um, equity, the equity courts and the law courts and the historians in the room can tell this story much better than I can. We're constantly bickering and fighting and trying to figure out who had jurisdiction over which cases and who had final say and so on and so forth. But even amidst the bickering and the jurisdictional fights, they were 
uh, learning from each other and uh, uh, borrowing from each other. And so um, uh, there's a chapter in the book by Ben Kremer about how uh, important an important development in the law, uh, uh, how new a new cause of action came out of equity and equity reasoning, but it was all along understood as a legal cause of action. So in that case, equitable principles gave rise to a new legal claim, and that's one way in which law and equity historically have interacted. Um, uh, there's uh, a worry when you have a volume like this that it's filled with true believers who um, I want to tell you that the most important thing in the world you can ever know is that law and equity are really cool and you really need to think about the difference between them in the history. Fortunately, we have a, uh, an internal skeptic in the book, so Stephen Wadham's chapter is basically, please, whatever you do, don't spend a lot of time worrying about the history of law and equity because it won't answer any questions. It'll just confuse you enormously. And if you want to do right by law, just think first order normatively about what the best legal rules are. Um, that's not my view, but it's good that we have that view uh, represented uh, in the book. Um, for those of you who do think of equity in sort of caricatured terms as this wide open, whatever the chancellor wants to do kind of thing, um, Patricia McMahon has a wonderful chapter saying actually equity, which is the source of our modern rules of discovery in both law and equity. So all that stuff in interrogatories, depositions, all that basically comes from equity. Uh, it wasn't part of the common law. Um, but she says, interestingly enough, in equity back in the good old days or bad old days, um, uh, the administration of the rules of discovery was actually much more rule governed than it is today under law. So there's a way in which equitable practice, famously discretionary, was actually less discretionary. And things like fishing expeditions that modern civil procedure scholars worry about just weren't really happening because the uh, judges in equity were pretty strict about when and how they would allow these discovery techniques. Um, there's one of the big puzzles in law and equity, I now know, um, is uh, a great sort of jurisprudential or philosophical question, which is, how can you have two bodies of rules or standards governing the same conduct? It, uh, it's fine if they agree, obviously, then you just have redundancy. But what if they don't agree? What if the law tells you to do one thing, so to speak, and the equity tells you to do something else? Now what? Seems like it violates a basic principle of the rule of law, that law is supposed to be able to guide your conduct. Um, and one of the major criticisms of equity is it's just a second body of law. And so how, why in the world would we want two not entirely consistent bodies of law? A lot of what Henry's work in equity has been and a lot of the themes in this book are saying, well, wait a second. Um, just because two sets of rules govern the same conduct doesn't mean they're the same kind of rules and doesn't mean that they're necessarily in conflict with one another. And we talk about this a bit in our particular chapter on torts and equity about you might think that, for example, there are rules governing conduct that are basically primary rules. Here's, here are your obligations. Here's how you must act towards one person, or here's how you must refrain from acting. Uh, that's a set of primary rules. We see that in tort. We see that uh, uh, in criminal law elsewhere. Um, equity might be more on the order of rules about rules, sort of second order rules, rules about how we're going to apply those rules or how courts are going to apply those rules. If that's what equity is doing, the idea that these two bodies are massively in conflict starts to dissipate pretty markedly. And Ben McFarland's chapter spells out why you can simultaneously um, uh, embrace Maitland and Hofeld, who were nominally uh, uh, deeply opposed on the question of whether equity constitutes a separate body of rules. McFarland says, actually, uh, Maitland, who thought they were separate, and Hofeld, who thought they weren't, are saying the same thing in different ways, and it's a really interesting chapter. Um, what are the conditions under which equity might thrive? Uh, Emily Sherwin's chapter says, uh, I think quite entertainingly, um, equity works, but only if you keep it a secret. Um, you can't tell anybody um, what's going on in the equity courts. We have to do it kind of on the sly because it's sort of taking the rules we have and saying, oh, we're not going to apply it in this case. Yeah, these are the rules. They apply. They govern you. But shh, every now and again, we'll give you a break. Um, uh, and the problem uh, she sees is that we stopped it, the, the, the cats out of the bag sometime around uh, 1938, give or take, and the rise of legal realism, the, uh, the secret got out. Uh, that equity allows you to avoid the rigors of the rules, and at that point it doesn't work anymore. So it's a little bit of a depressing chapter because by the end there's no hope, uh, basically. Um, at least unless we can put the cat in the bag, which nobody thinks we can do. Um, 
Another theme is, instead of thinking in law and equity as two separate jurisdictions that are relatively static, and I've already alluded to this a moment ago, it might be more helpful to think about them as interacting, and not only interacting, but having a kind of shifting frontier. So things that used to be in the domain of law might end up in the domain of equity and vice versa. Where equity intervened, uh, uh, sometimes you can actually generate what previously did not exist in the law as a cause of action <clears throat> or as a, a defense. Um, and sort of keeping track of that shifting frontier is in some ways one of the most interesting and tricky parts of studying law and equity. So an example we give in our chapter is, used to be that if someone was about to disclose some of your uh, untoward secrets, your diaries or what have you, um, and again, I defer to the historians, but the basic idea, as I understand it, is under certain circumstances, you could run to a court of equity and enjoin the publication of these confidential materials. Um, uh, this was a breach of confidence, and uh, equity would enjoin certain breaches of confidence. Okay? Well, as that happened increasingly, it started to look like there was a body of law based on these individual equitable decisions, and lo and behold, courts started saying, <clears throat> law courts started saying, well, wait a second, <clears throat> if we're going to enjoin these breaches of confidence, it's maybe because we think there's something wrong with uh, people disclosing certain kinds of personal information. And when we think something's wrong, we have a word for that. The word is tort, which means wrong. Um, and lo and behold, we start getting tort causes of action in law for uh, invasion of privacy, disclosure of private facts. And so the equitable granting of relief to these breach of confidence uh, claimants ends up becoming a new tort, uh, uh, the tort of uh, misappropriation of likeness. Uh, so that's an, interest, uh, an interesting example of this interaction. Matthew Harding has another example in his book, uh, his book chapter on uh, charities. Um, uh, so uh, I hope this convinces you, at least uh, intrigues you, into thinking that there is a lot going on here and that there's a lot to talk about. Let me just end with a few more words on our chapter. In some ways, we're a little bit of outliers here uh, in this book, um, me especially. But um, what we are reacting to as much as anything is um, uh, something that was on one of Henry's earlier slides. Let's see if I can it maybe. Um, <clears throat> this. <clears throat> this thing. <clears throat> so um, a law students will know that uh, when you start reading judicial opinions from the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, US judicial opinions, you'll see this kind of language all over the place. Everything's a multi-factor test, right? You want to know if there's liability? Well, you have to consider 56 things, um, each of which points in a different direction. Um, the good news about this, of course, is it gives courts a lot of flexibility. And if you think the job of the courts is basically to do justice in an open-ended way in an individual case, this is terrific. Um, if you worry that um, uh, uh, courts should do some other things like make some rules or set some standards that give us some guidance on the duties we owe to other people, so on and so forth, this is less good. Um, and so our suggestion in our chapter and in some of our work more generally is um, if you take a version of the law equity distinction seriously, you can, in theory at least, maybe not in practice, have the best of both worlds, which is you can have a system that's relatively rule-like, that actually does guide conduct, that isn't just whatever um, uh, at the level of primary rules of conduct, but then if there are particularly awful or egregious abuses of the rules, abuses of right, malicious, so on and so forth. That's where equity can step in as kind of tempering the harshness of the rules. That's at least one understanding of what equi equity was always designed to do. And our claim is that it could still do that. The only problem is you actually have to believe that there's something called law um, and something called legal rules that equity exists to temper and modify, and that view in the United States has been very out of fashion for a long time. Yes, we are a law school, but we don't, we all, the point of law school is to teach you that actually law is whatever we need it to be, or it's just justice dressed up in fancy words, or it's just power dressed up in fancy words, or whatever. Um, so ours is at one level a kind of old fashioned project, which is to say, no, actually, there's a thing called law, and it has something to do with rules and standards and things like that, but just because it is doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, destined to be harsh and uh, unforgiving and inflexible, that's where equity comes in. So, thank you. Happy
happy to take questions if people have them or comments. The current inclination to uh, to uh, uh, issue injunctions against anything Trump does uh, 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 nationwide is that an example of the dangers of equity that you cite on in, in your folder? The dangers of equity would you consider one of the dangers? Um, so uh, the chapter here that deals with this most is uh, Sam Bray's chapter, and he's. Uh, he sort of started a lot of this discussion going. He's a, uh, he's a skeptic of the nationwide injunction. That's a, I would say, the, to answer your question directly, I do think that uh, the nationwide injunction is, in a sense, a classic equitable problem because the, the, uh, the equitable tool is a very powerful one. And the question is what limits should be on it and then where the limits should come from. Uh, and you have sort of competing uh, problems here that uh, equity is there to solve problems, but it isn't always available. And um, I am not uh, particularly an expert on this particular question, but I will say that uh, if I think it fits into a pattern of equity in the Sup U.S. Supreme Court in particular that uh, maybe grows out of competing visions of uh, originalism and textualism versus uh, living constitutionalism and uh, purposivism on the other hand. And it, it's a, a little bit of an example of what I was saying before that uh, it's very polarized. So that uh, on the one hand, you have the sort of skeptics who will say, well, if it wasn't done in 1789, we're not talking about it. That's one view of equity. On the other hand, uh, there's the view that, well, equity had its generative spirit. And so why not uh, is another view. And I think the, because equity has sort of stopped being what it was, that it, it stopped being, as John described, a kind of a, a second system, that those are the main uh, choices on offer. If you look at sort of equity itself, I mean, the word equity is used in the Constitution and the Judiciary Act and so forth, that it had its own sort of internal uh, generative spirit and limits, and I'm not sure that uh, it would we would get as clean an answer as people are looking for to these questions about uh, the scope of injunctions in these kinds of contexts. Uh, but you know, I think there are limits, but there are kind of internal limits to equity, uh, and it has to be evaluated against the background. So, for instance, if we had uh, a, a, a different sort of expedited appeal that would uh, that would operate directly on equity self conception, uh, and so. You know, th there's a lot to talk about there, but I do think that uh, the view about some of these questions is so polarized, not just because, w you know, we have a polarized background of, you know, politics, but also because the legal question itself is inherently polarized because of the way we've uh, fused equity out of the, the legal system. Sorry. Um, just a comment on the last question. I mean, uh, I don't know what the problem in the United States is that led to the nationwide injunction, but it's not a, it's not a new problem. So um, English courts for at least a dozen years, maybe more, have been giving worldwide freezing orders. And for the simple reason that you can move your assets out of a jurisdiction very easily. You can't sort of allow people to freeze it in the various jurisdictions where the assets are. You can easily escape justice because you can exploit the rules of different jurisdictions. Well, it's funny you bring up freezing injunctions because, if anything, the classic example of the Supreme Court taking these sort of dichotomous positions and, you know, and I will say truly dichotomous, uh, is exactly in the freezing order. So a uh, freezing order case came up in the late 90s and uh, the Supreme Court said, no, you, uh, the equity power of the federal courts does not extend to what you would call a Moravia injunction because it wasn't done in 1789, end of story. And the dissent from, uh, this was a, uh, Justice Scalia's opinion, and the dissent was from Justice Grinsberg was, look, equity is creative. It's, you know, that's the nature of equity and so forth and we should allow it, which I think is, is in some sense closer to being uh, right, but gave zero uh, indication of where the limits of that principle would be. And so that's why I say this is, uh, you know, freezing injunction is exactly the kind of issue that you wind up with two very stark choices in the American context. 
So here's my real question, yeah. which was... <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> which, um, which is just whether you think that, um, especially given your perspective, that it still makes sense to categorize um, certain areas of law as equitable or as um, legal, right? So yeah. unjust enrichment would be an example because it does seem to have been, at least the, the intellectual sources were very much on the equity side, not the common law side. Um, and the other example I would think of is the law of trusts. I mean, I teach trusts, and so I'm a trust guy, and so I have to teach the origins of equity. But I, but I also don't think that, you know, there's any real remnant for most of the doctrine in things like equitable maxims or unconscionability. It's just a, it's just a, a facilitative device for managing assets. Um, yeah. So I, I think in terms of trust, uh, you can sort of see. Uh, you know, sort of like equity in amber or something. It's, it, it's you, you sort of see the contours of what it was, but I agree that in terms of, if we're going to take a sort of functional view of equity, this sort of moving frontier that uh, John was describing, I wouldn't necessarily put trust in there. And I wouldn't also say that uh, law was devoid of these kinds of uh, uh, considerations or structures or second order, you know, analysis that, uh, that we're talking about. I will say that in terms of the book, uh, you know, I, it's very tempting for me to impose my views on it. You know, so I have this idea that, you know, that there was a major theme of equity. It's one that we misunderstand because we misunderstand equity. But you could call it system one and system two. I don't think that's the way to go. I mean, we, we don't start from scratch like that. But I don't think the authors in this book necessarily agree with me that uh, about, you know, what equity's main function is or, or whatever. There's a lot of diversity of view in here. And so I think there are people in here who would care that trusts come from equity. And in that sense, the whole phenomenon here is a little bit more diffuse, I think, than we've been making it sound because I think we've been sort of, we have a, a vision of what it's, uh, what it's doing. But we not only have skeptics in here, but we also have people in here who I think are much more tied to the way the jurisdiction works and so forth, and that's a different kind of account uh, where you know trust would be much more central, and uh, some of these um, problems we're talking about wouldn't be necessarily seen as especially equitable. You would refer to intellectual sources; that's uh, maybe a step in our direction. But just to add very quickly, I think um, I think it's less important to worry about you know which body of law falls under which label than to be reminded that um, uh, equity. Uh, had certain concerns and addressed certain kinds of problems and a reminder that there is once was a law and equity distinction more sharply drawn than today is helpful in reminding courts that there's a range of resources available to them to resolve problems so one in the um in my world the problem is everything just becomes a tort because torts means whatever it's just torts has come to court right torts is oh you think something bad has happened in the world come in and the judge might do something about it um, uh, and that's in part a symptom of and caused by a forgetting of equity where you might say actually no torts is a collection of fairly well-defined wrongs that are sometimes tweaked and modified in equity so being mindful of equity just as a kind of mode uh, of analysis, I think, can help uh, courts avoid making certain kind of mistakes that are avoidable and unhelpful. Um, thank you. So I think my question echoes a, a little bit on what you said. Um, I was wondering what you would suggest we should take from uh, the history of this fusion going forward. So how would you want um, courts to I mean, you pointed out a little bit, but would you elaborate on what you think we should take away from this history? So um, I, I don't advocate a separate equity course. I think there may be one or two people who actually do. Uh, and uh, I think there are people in Australia who kind of regret not having them anymore. Um, but so my, my takeaway would be that uh, it's important to keep uh, equity as a label and to use it as a label to um, get clear on what triggers equity, so the combinations of bad faith and uh, disproportionate hardship, and then once we're in there, what are we doing? You know, the, make it clear what the sort of presumptions are and what, what happens when we do the presumptions. And so put all the structure the, the back in there without having the separate courts. Now one question, and it's a good one, is 
whether that's even possible, you know, one view of this is that equity was so developed in here because we had separate courts and that now that we don't, it's inevitable that they're going to bleed into each other and get assimilated and uh, especially if we sort of keep the realist spirit alive and uh, the idea that, you know, we have these presumptions and so forth. If we don't take that seriously, then I think it's uh, it's not going to happen. But I think uh, it does presuppose a certain vision of law that um, there is a kind of structure and architecture and that it's doing something and that having specialized parts of the law that are more formal and less formal actually makes things better. And I think the more we get that out in the open, the more likely it can work, but I'm not at all sure that it can without the separate equity courts, in which case we're kind of stuck. Hi, thank you. Professor Smith, I know you're teaching a restitution class next semester, um, and I kind of have two questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions kind of tied to that and also to what Professor Prenner brought up regarding unjust enrichment. Um, so I know that Emily Sherwin's written a chapter here. I just recently read her thoughts in the Boston University Symposium on Slave Reparations. Um, and so I'm wondering if you think that equity in general, or restitution in particular, um, could have a claim for descendants of those who experienced the actual inequities and or those who may not have had the claim historically, such as those from former colonies. Um, yes, I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I think that there are kind of two ways of uh, looking at that. One is sort of more specific to restitution, and um, this has been a very interesting topic of, uh, you know, to what extent restitution principles could inform the uh, rectification of uh, historic injustices. And, um, you know, one view is that it could be kind of restitution writ large. Another view is that those kinds of questions are kind of so overwhelming and so... Uh, uh, so have their own character that private law restitution may not uh, tell you very much other than that we have this principle and that it might work out uh, differently in that uh, in that area and we you know we might want to do things in that area that we don't uh, in another to take another example you know adverse possession doesn't work the way you might think it does you know when we're talking about you know mass injustice and uh, stolen not art stolen by Nazis and so forth so there is a, there is a sort of you know, uh, as a scale uh, or qualitative um, uh, question. I think on a more micro level, though, there's um, uh, another dimension to this, which is that if you look at some of these historic injustices and when they come up as something that we could conceivably address, that's much later than the legal system imagines for ordinary kinds of claims. And I think there's room for better thinking about doctrines like latches and so forth when it comes to some of these uh, larger scale injustices that the idea that latches would work differently I think is actually quite equitable uh, to, to, to consider that. So the, so the idea that you know, Native American land claims are barred by latches in a sort of you know, cut and dried you know, textbook way I think is uh, inappropriate. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the about balancing tests and particularly whether you notice a difference um, in court in states that still have separate equity courts in how their law courts treat balancing tests and, and whether they have them like every other state or whether there's fear of them. I think the reason I'm asking is is whether you see the impact of equity and fusion on sort of the way these tests develop as being because the courts themselves have fused or because the way we think about equity and legal culture has changed. So uh, that's a really good question. I'm a little, uh, I should let, uh, I, I shouldn't, uh, I'll, I'll just say I'm a little pessimistic yeah, because I think that the uh, Delaware Chancery Court, which is like the paradigm case of this, uh, is pretty fond of uh, balancing tests and so forth. I mean, I, I don't, you know, impressionistically, I don't, it, it'd be worth looking into, but I, I don't, I'm, I wouldn't be super hopeful that that's uh, been the case. It's a, it's, a term, it's a possibility, and that, that's a good question, but I think the, the sort of way of thinking about law is so overwhelming that I don't think, uh, I, I wouldn't expect a whole lot from it. Um, so, uh, but I, it, it would be look, worth looking into, yeah. I should, I should say that, um, this is slightly responsive to your question, but I'm using it as an excuse um, to, to say something related, which is, um, I mentioned before that, um, that I have a kind of frustration with courts that are, um, uh, too loosey-goosey about law, 
Um, uh, but there is the opposite problem, which is courts that are too formalistic about law in the pejorative sense. And um, in some ways, the, the problem we may be facing often when things go wrong in the law, which isn't always, is we've either got, we, we, we are presented with a choice of either it's one or the other. Either you have to be a sort of hair shirted formalist and, uh, you know, stick to the rules no matter what and, and never mind that, you know, terrible things are happening. Um, or you, or it's all or not, you know, it's up for grabs, whatever it needs to be, and then we'll do justice. And um, my instinct anyway is that um, we should be looking for more of a kind of middle way. Um, and I think there are some, I don't know what, you know, which jurisdictions correlate with that middle way and, and what would explain it, but I think there are some. Thank you. Uh as background to my question, I come from New South Wales and must say that uh, the way we're taught, it's less of a fusion fallacy as a fusion heresy. They're very, very strong on never doing that. And I suppose I wanted, wondered to what extent you think that um, whether or not a jurisdiction fuses equity is merely a function of how comfortable it is in developing doctrines of all types or whether there's something quite specific about equity. Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I think um, that expectations in many places, including here, were extremely high for a fusion, that it would solve all sorts of problems. And it happened in an era when people were increasingly skeptical about uh, the law itself. Um, and so it so here it played out in terms of um, the sort of like uh, contextualizing law and sort of making it all kind of, um, you know, somewhat more indeterminate. That didn't happen in other jurisdictions. Uh, but I think, uh, like Josh Gessler has shown that in a way, the same dynamic played out, say in England, where, uh, fusion or merger meant that people weren't as distinctively looking for what, what I would call an equitable function, but they were still trying to do trying to solve these problems and how it came out was not in terms of smushy uh, multi-factor balancing tests, but in terms of highly articulated, very Baroque law. And that was a sort of way of solving in law what this more sort of two-tier structure uh, might have done in an earlier era. And so, uh, you know, I've ha haven't gotten the re reaction from like English lawyers. Well, you know, we have a very vibrant equity tradition. So what you're saying has no relevance. And I think that's not right. I think uh, that something was lost across the board, even, I won't say about Australia, but you know, something was lost across the board. And, but the symptoms are very different because the nature of the legal system here and in England and Canada and so forth are, is, is different. So the symptoms have to be different, but I think the underlying cause is very similar. Great. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it.